Welcome to your iconic image. If you want to take control of your image and be a power player in your space, then this is the show for you. Here we will arm you with tools and information to help you grow your brand on purpose. I'm your host, Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Now let's dive into today's episode. I have with me today, John Dalrymple, who is president and managing partner of Geary Company Advertising in Las Vegas, Nevada. And John works to help create compelling and memorable brands. And it's worth noting that you have worked with some very impressive clientele, whether it be hotels, uh, Gladys Knight, and tell everybody who actually the Geary Company's first client was. Well, our agency was founded by essentially Elvis Presley. So we go, we go back a ways. I wasn't here at the time, but uh, Colonel Tom Parker was, was close friends, became close friends with my business partner's stepfather, asked him to open an agency and Elvis would be his first client. And that happened in 1969. So from that time, 69, Elvis was kind of a lead client, but they handled a host of entertainers, all of the big names that you can even imagine up through about the middle eighties. Uh, when my business partner, Jim McCusick jumped in as his stepfather became ill and took over the agency. And then we, you know, it expanded out into home builders, automobile dealers, resorts, casinos. So we have a long list of, of, of people that we've worked with, but you know, when it comes to iconic names, uh, certainly Elvis is number one. Uh, it's hard to get more iconic than him. That would and be then, true. you know, uh, we've worked with Hyatt, Gladys Knight, Rich Little, Smokey Robinson, you know, um, Ford, Porsche, Lexus, you know, you name yes. it. The list goes on and on. So yeah. then let's just ask, so what makes an icon to you? Well, look, okay. The word icon is used a lot, maybe almost universally. And, and there are icons in local markets, in regional markets, and in national markets, and in worldwide markets in a number of different areas. I mean, we could name them sports, music, business, brands, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, when we talk about what makes something or someone iconic, there are some things that, that you really need to look at. And, and Marlene, you do a great job with this because one of those things, and, that, and, and we have commonality in that, is finding the distinct or unique aspects of a business, a brand, an individual. We go through a great deal of the discovery. We ask a lot of questions to find those unique elements that make someone or something or some brand distinctive. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that you capture that in your photography. There's a spirit, there's an element, there's a vibe, there's an energy that you're able to capture that really feeds into someone becoming iconic. So the first thing is finding that unique quality that, that makes someone or something iconic, that distinct nature of it. And then, you know, it, it's really kind of about that idea that that unique quality, that distinction is relevant to a certain group of people, to an audience, to a customer base, or even to those within your life, in your sphere of influence. That's kind of the second piece of it. And then the third piece of it is that relevancy, that uniqueness is able to last over time. There's kind of time associated with that that leads to it becoming iconic. Uh, now, having said that, I mean, we can have within our lives personal icons and we can actually become iconic to those that we're in relationships with or in our families or, or in our communities or, or our companies. But, you know, those are kind of the elements is, is having that uniqueness and, and, and having it be relevant and then bringing that forward over a period of time. And, you know, it's kind of back to the basics, too, that we, we talk about with, with businesses and brands, and that's being consistent. And consistency builds trust, whether that's in business or in your personal life, being consistent. And consistency leads to that relevancy over time. Mm. So, I mean, you might want to think back, you know, how many times have you had a really great experience when you've gone out to a restaurant? Really great experience. Ah, you know, we think about it, you know, it probably takes us a while to think about it, but think about the time that you had a bad experience. 
Okay, that probably comes to mind right away, whether it was a restaurant or anything else. That bad experience we remember forever. So being consistent with quality or whatever you're delivering in that unique aspect over time builds that brand, that iconic status. So whatever that image is we develop, you got to be able to live by it. Mm. You know, if, if we create a fantastic image or you great, get a great shot, but when somebody comes in personally to meet with that individual or that business and they don't deliver on that promise, I mean, it's over. Right. So, so having core values and having a fundamental base that you can live by consistency lends itself to an iconic status. I don't know if that makes sense, but mm-hmm. that's kind of, you know, what we see and what we've experienced, what I've experienced. So do you think that it is easier to, or, or let me ask it a different way. Okay. At what point do you feel that, um, someone reaches an iconic status, because I think it's also interesting to note too, that there's a difference between being reaching some kind of celebrity status and being an icon. Yeah. Um, How would you describe the difference? Well, I, I think the difference relates to substance. You have to be able to deliver value, a quality experience, a depth and texture of relationship. A lot of times celebrity can be very superficial or or just on the surface. So a real iconic status has depth and texture to it that's real. Mm -hmm. And you and I talk about the 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 word authentic, uh, which you know you you would suggest would be transparent. And I think that's true. There has to be a depth to it. You have to have some degree of core values that you live by or you consistently deliver to get to that iconic status. And in the world today that we live in with social media, you will see people rise to high degrees of celebrity and then be gone within the next 15 minutes because it was superficial. It was, it didn't have that depth to it, but those that do achieve that status over time and, and time plays a role in that in today's world, though, time is compressed. Somebody can, you know, reach that iconic status in a very short period of time and and stay there because of the ability of the dissemination of information and, and their qualities and what they have done. And some of it relates to their background and, you know, are these people real or are they not? But anyhow, that's that's kind of my take on it. Mm-hmm. it takes depth, substance, and, and within that, you know, the word quality always comes out in the framework. So then at what point would you say someone has, someone or something has achieved icon status? I, I think when it really, that uniqueness becomes memorable and you remember it and it resonates with you and it resonates with those within your sphere of influence and and you continue to be that brand or that person and, and that really, really matters. And, and people can, and you can become iconic in your sphere of influence or in the area that you compete in. You don't have to have a worldwide reputation. You don't have to have a national reputation. You can do that locally. Mm -hmm. You can do that in your family. You can do that in your relationships. It, it, you know, you can become iconic And, and maybe that's the goal. And that's something we talk to people about is become iconic in the sphere in which you compete. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. It does. So then what about impact? Um, do you feel that icons have created an impact then, or do you, um, yeah, let me ask that. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if we go look at Webster's definition of an icon, it says something to the effect that it's a person or a thing that's regarded as symbolic or worthy of veneration, veneration meaning great respect or reverence. Um, you know, when we think about that definition, there there are brands and there are people that that become iconic that you know that we respect, that we recognize as as you know doing great things, and and conversely, there are iconic. Things that are of um, that are bad, 
No, which actually brings that. up which actually brings up an interesting point. Yeah. Do you think that when you reach that kind of a status that you have a degree of responsibility? Well, I think so. I, I, I do. I, I, you know, and that, and that gets back to perhaps the world of celebrity and sports where you have so many people that look up to individuals. And, and you know, when I think of a, a sports icon right now, uh, there are a number of, of really quality individuals doing great things. Uh, you know, for me, uh, having uh, come from Seattle, I've lived in the desert now for about 27 years, but I look at uh, Russell Wilson, the quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks, and I have many, many friends in Seattle, and I know that he and his wife do so many great things for the community where they go to Children's Hospital, and they are working to make a difference, not just on the field, but off the field. And I, and I think when you get to that point in time that you do have a responsibility. And, and sometimes that responsibility, unless you're built on that framework of, let's call it real, can be crushing because mm -hmm. you can't maintain that. And that's where image has superseded the quality and the depth and texture of, of what it took to get there. And, and I think that's where you see sometimes on that very thin layer of celebrity iconicity, if that's even a word, uh, that, that, that it crushes people. But, but when you're built on that basis of being genuine, of creating real trust and being who you are and delivering an experience of who you are, you're able to accept that responsibility and deal with it in a way that continues to uplift and strengthen people and deliver that experience that you're looking to deliver. So hmm. kind of thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that you pulled Russell Wilson out because I happen to be a fan of Russell Wilson and I don't follow the Seahawks, but I like him. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So what about images and, um, and things would oh, you yeah. say this, the same thing applies to them that they, there has to be a depth to it. There has to be, it has to stand for something for it to be. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And this is probably particularly relevant to how you go about approaching photography and trying to capture a spirit that's meaningful, that can be compelling and memorable. And maybe Nike is one of the best examples of that. I mean, the Nike swoosh has lived on forever. Uh, it's funny because here in Vegas, I know a couple of people that started with, with Phil Knight in the early days of Nike up in Oregon, and they've got some wonderful stories about how that got started. And one of them is the actual swoosh itself was developed by a graphic designer that I think they paid $35 to in, in 1971. Wow. And uh, uh, just an aside, when I was in Seattle, I had the chance to go down to the offices of Wyden and Kennedy, which was the ad agency for Nike. And it was just just a fantastic experience and, and just amazing offices with a full court basketball court in there. But Nike always puts out a compelling image with a subtlety of the swoosh, but it's always there. Mm -hmm. And, and so imagery plays a key role in developing that, that icon status, if you will, imagery is really important and, and imagery can connect emotion to the brand or to the person. And emotion makes it memorable. Mm. And that's what we want to get to. I mean, when we think about branding, we also look for imagery that we can marry with the messaging to create a compelling and memorable and emotional connection. So it, it, it's critical. So imagery is critical. And you, you always want that imagery to reflect what that icon stands for. And, and so, you know, we, we look for that. The other piece of that, too, when you're talking about, you know, creating imagery and emotion and tying them together, we found that music has been a key part of that. Music really creates emotion. So if we find and sometimes we'll spend 8, 12, 16 hours looking for the right music mm -hmm. to layer in with a message or to put underneath like an image that you might have, have shot, mm -hmm. that can connect the emotion to the image 
and help solidify that memory of what this really stands for. What do you really stand for? And so that that's something we look at. And, and that's kind of, you know, where I would lean over to, say, Gladys Knight. You know, one of the incredible, iconic songs that she does is Midnight Train to Georgia. Mm -hmm. And if you really listen to that, there is a depth and texture of emotion mm -hmm. in that song that that's not only moving, but it's powerful and it connects us to the message. And it's just it's just incredible. And by the way, Gladys and her husband are some of the nicest people that you'd ever meet. She has just a fabulous family. They're wonderful, wonderful people. And her talent is just absolutely incredible. It's God given. And it's it's really she sings and develops music by ear. Mm. Uh, something I've never been able to do. I my mom made me take piano when I was like eight for about six years. Uh, <laughs> Till sports kind of took over, but anyhow, you, you know, know that, that makes me that makes me really happy to hear too because I'm a huge fan of hers. I oh, think yeah. okay. it's just absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. And you know, so many times, what is presented or what you think about people, yeah, because of um, the way they have been packaged, so to speak, yeah, doesn't turn out to be the way. They are in some yeah. cases. And so that makes me really happy to hear that she is exactly what I thought she would be. Oh, she really is. She really is. She has a wonderful family, um, kids, grandkids, um, you, you name it. Uh, but she she and her husband are real. And so are their family members that that I've had a chance to meet. And by the way, her, her brother Bubba was one of the pips, probably the one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet. Uh, I rank him right up there with the top comedians of the day. He's just he's just that good. Just 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 fun. I mean, they're 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 great people. Which, you know, that actually brings me to an offshoot question. Let's say you are packaging a person or a let's just say a person. And do you start with who they are or do you start with the way they want to be seen? That's a great question. And, you know, I, I think it's both. You know, we want to go into a discovery of, of where you are. What is the current situation? Where are you today? And where do you want to be in the next one, three, and five years? And let's, let's take a look at that plan. And what can you deliver today that is unique and distinct? And then we can you know, message in a very compelling and memorable way that will help you get to the next goals or, or level that's used a lot these days in the next, in the next year, within the next mm -hmm. year, what can you do? And then, you know, sometimes a year time frame is too long and, and it's hard to visualize a year, particularly a year like 2020. Right. Um, you know, it, it's hard to see that far in the future. So we'll break it down into 90 days. What can we do in the next 90 days to help move you forward on a pathway to get to that longer distance goal or, or image? So I, I think you have to really define both of those, where you are today and where you want to go and be able to articulate that. And then underneath that, then we get into some of the planning aspects. Then we get mm -hmm. into the messaging aspects. We look for the imagery. We look for someone who can help us bring to life that imagery like you that can do that. And then we can marry those things together so that, you know, it, it takes people on that pathway of, of creating memorable, compelling content and leads them to that status of becoming iconic. And maybe iconic is more a leader in their field. Right. A leader where they where they compete or where they want to be. So. Well, as you, I, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, just because you've reached iconic status, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are world renowned. That's right, and 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 you don't have to be. Right. Uh, you know, let me, you know, for me, and this guy doesn't even know he's an icon to me, but um, I, I call this the legend of Wallace Zernick. I, I was I was coaching these nine, ten year old guys in baseball, and and Wallace 
was kind of behind the curve physically. I mean, Wallace looked like he was just a helmet with two legs running around the bases. And he, he struggled to hit the ball. He couldn't hit. So I worked with him throughout the season twice a week, just him alone in, in his own individual batting practice to help him get there. We got towards the end of the season, still hadn't gotten on base. And, uh, and we're in a game, and Wallace comes up to bat, and I'm coaching third, and I pull him in, and I go, Wallace, just give me your best. Just, just try to get to first base. Well, uh, lo and behold, Wallace hits the ball, and it kind of gets by the shortstop, but he, he backhands it, and he's throwing to first, and Wallace is beating out the throw. He's on first base, and, and I'm just going crazy. I'm so happy for him, but I, I look over there, and Wallace isn't on first base. It's like, where in the world is Wallace? Is he running down the right field line? Where'd he go? And I look, and he's halfway to second base. And, and it surprises me, but it surprised the first baseman. So he, he didn't react in time. And when he throws the ball, Wallace is on second base. Well, the next batter gets up. I think there were two outs and, and hits a ground ball, and he gets thrown out. And, and I pull Wallace over. I go, Wallace, what, what, wait, what were you doing? He goes, Coach, it was never my goal to get to first base. I always wanted to get to second base. i would never been there. And I thought, oh. you know, all of a sudden the player becomes a coach mm-hmm. and, and I've never forgotten that. And so about six months ago, I'm driving through Las Vegas and I come by an office building and it says Wallace Zernick, attorney at law. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, so to me, you know, um, Little Wallace, the helmet with two legs, is an icon. I mean, he had his goal, and when he got his opportunity, he didn't stop, and he went for it 100%. Could have got thrown out. Didn't matter. He was going for second base. And, and so, you know, maybe it's overblown, the idea that we have to be publicized or popular on, on a broader basis to be an icon. I don't think so. I really don't. I think in your sphere of influence, in your local market, you can become an icon by being consistent and delivering service and delivering an experience that people will find not only compelling, but memorable. Mm -hmm. And if it becomes memorable and it's relevant to them over time, you know, you could probably use that term icon and that's okay. That's, that's good. Yeah. I love that story. Wallace, he's a guy. I couldn't believe it. There it is. Wallace Zernick, attorney at law. And you know what? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. So do you think that icons all have something in common or um, there's, I know you had mentioned at one point in a conversation that there seems to be an element that most have. And it was that they've all overcome something. Do you think that is? Yeah. Generally true. Yeah, I do. I I do think so. I mean, the road to success is paved with plenty of potholes and being able to deal with adversity and setbacks while keeping your eye focused on your goal and where you want to be is, is critically important. And maybe even more important in today's world where collectively we've, we've experienced a tremendous amount of setback, a tremendous amount of difficulty, uh, uncertainty. It's led to a great deal of anxiety. So I, I think for those who are going forward, A, you have to anticipate that you're going to face a great deal of adversity to get to where you want to go. So being able to deal with adversity is part of that process, I think, of getting to that iconic status. And and it's, it's about being mentally tough. It's about being emotionally strong. That doesn't mean we don't break down from time to time. That doesn't mean we don't feel it or we, we have those moments of anxiety and depression. Yeah, those are real. I, in our company, it's been surprising, I think, to see how people have dealt with this COVID situation. We, we've essentially have been working from home since 1st of March. And um, I come in the office every day. My business partner comes in the office every day because we're, we're completely socially distanced, but we got everybody working and that allows for distance and sometimes disconnect. So one of the things that we've done to try to keep people connected 
and to give them a mechanism by which they can express that anxiety and work collectively to overcome adversity was to put out some music every morning. Everybody's assigned a day where they put out music and a message and it could be their favorite song. And, and we thought this would last for a little while while it's still going today. So we had some, some really great music this week. Uh, we had some really motivational things this week, but you see people in that expression of music talk about how this has been difficult for them and how they found a way to stay connected and uplifted through the use of music or, or other mechanisms. And so adversity is part of what we all deal with. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to continue to deal with it. That means, you know, one of the things that that helps with adversity is remaining optimistic. Mm -hmm. Things are going to work out. Optimism is a great gift that you can give to yourself and, and to the people around you. The other thing that that's incredibly powerful is to live in gratitude. When you find yourself surrounded by a myriad of negative news stories. Hey, maybe turn off the news. But B, before you go there, look at all the things that you can be grateful for mm -hmm. and, and, and enumerate those and think about those and share those with those around you. And, and it could be the simplest of things. You know what? I'm grateful that I'm here today. You know, having worked through adversity, having you know, been on the doorstep of death four different times, you know what? I'm grateful that today I'm here mm -hmm. and that you and I have a chance to talk. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that, you know what, um, I have a roof over my head and that, you know, I was able to have dinner last night. Not sure I could tell you what it was, but I'm grateful for it. <laughs> it was good. Now, we actually had a City League softball game last night, so uh, it was positive before the game. But, uh, you know, I, I think there's – that that's something that needs to be touched on a little bit too, is the fact that people feel that they need to pretend like their, their struggles never existed, but it's actually those struggles and the challenges and things like that, that actually draw us into somebody's story. Like I could tell you a story that there was a woman who was in a band with her husband and, you know, had great success. And then she went on to success on her own. Or I could tell you that, the husband beat her up all the time. She finally escaped with, I think it was six cents and a mobile credit card. And then this, and became this international sensation that she is. And we buy much more into Tina Turner's story. Yeah. yeah. So I think there is, there's a need to, to tell what you've overcome because there is shared there's, there's something shared in all of that. Yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and that's about getting down to that real talk area, about getting down to what's real, because nobody, nobody escapes adversity. Nobody escapes challenge. Nobody escapes difficulties. That's, that's part of what we deal with. Uh, and so, you know, really recognizing that everybody that we meet is going through something. Right. And, and, and knowing that they're going through something, uh, you know, there's never a wrong time to do the right thing or to be kind, never a wrong time. And so, you know, you know, I, I've had my challenges. I, I, I've had to overcome adversity. I've, I've had to look myself in the mirror and say, you know, am I going to be here tomorrow or am I not? And, uh you know, when your life's kind of hanging in the balance like that, when you get that phone call and, and the doc says, hey, you got cancer. OK, uh, where do we go from here? Uh, you know, those challenges, I think, and the vulnerability that that people talk about bond us together and collectively help us to lift each other. And that's a great gift. Mm hmm. That's a great gift. And to know that other people are going through issues, too. And, and that could be business issues. That could be personal issues. I, you know, when I was <clears throat> when I was leading a company, um, I always said my door was open. And and I, I've had people come in and share very personal uh, 
difficult experiences. And it wasn't so much that I could fix it. It was more about I could feel it and I could hear it. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I could offer them the feeling back that they were cared for mm. and that, that it mattered. And, and when you're talking about leadership or you're talking about iconicity, people are the most important asset in any organization or in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so treating people well and, and listening to them, uh, I think, is a key part of success in anything that you do. Okay. And, and, and probably the most important thing. You know, when 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 all of this goes away, how do we treat each other? And, and in today's world, I mean, it it's rough out there. I mean, if you look at the Las Vegas marketplace right now, our hotel capacities are limited uh, and the restaurants down to 25 percent. Now, I grew up in the restaurant with with my folks. I grew up in the back of the restaurant, used to do my homework in the back booth. And if your capacity is down to 25 percent, being able to sustain your business over a long period of time is really, really difficult. Many won't make it. You know, I also know that, you know, my son works as a service assistant and, and part time server at the Yardbird restaurant, uh, which is Southern Comfort Food in the Venetian. A little bit of Elvis, a little bit of chicken and waffles, a little bit of good stuff like that. Um, and we went down there on a Tuesday night uh, about a week ago and everything's socially distanced, obviously, and we were masked up and everything. But I asked the management team at the Venetian how they're doing. And they were at 11% occupancy. Wow. And that's really hard to live with. Mm. So we've got a marketplace right now where you may have upwards of 180,000 to 300,000 people that aren't sure of their next paycheck and what's happening. And are they going to have future employment? Are they not? What's going to happen? And, and uh, you know, we got to reach out to people mm -hmm. and, and understand a little bit more about what they're going through to offer a, a listening ear and a helping hand, whatever that looks like. I mean, it, 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 it could be anything. It could be the next meal. It could be dropping cookies by their doorstep. It just could be sending them a card saying, hey, you know what? I care. Mm -hmm. I care. But our, our market is, you know, it's going to rebound. It'll probably come back significantly about mid-second quarter to end of second quarter. As vaccines get distributed, as travel opens up, uh, this is such a wonderful place for people to come to uh, where they can really kind of uh, relax and have fun and see incredible entertainment that it will rebound fairly quickly. But there's a big gap between now and then. Mm -hmm. And there are people who need help. And, and that's just not here. I mean, that's around the country. I mean, if right. you look at, at what's going on. So, so again, it's never, never the wrong time to do the right thing or to reach out to people and to connect with them. And, and communication is, is the critical aspect to that. I don't believe we can over communicate in today's environment, mm. being able to communicate and over communicate and stay in touch and be consistent with that, I think is important to everybody's mental health, emotional health, and ultimately success. So, yeah. All right, John, we're down to the final four questions. First oh one is, <laughs> it's going to be tough. What's the best piece of advice you were ever given? All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I thought about this. <clears throat> My dad, you know, um, I was, I was the youngest and he was about 46 when I was born. And as I was coming up and I was playing sports and uh, he was beginning to step out kind of in the restaurant business. So the thing that he told me was to be honest, to do what you say and to say what you do. And, and that if you can do that and you can shake somebody's hands and say, I'm going to do it and you do it. Sometimes you don't even need a contract. And I can tell you in our business, I, I've had a couple of relationships like that where we've been their advertising agency for eight years on a handshake. Mm. And uh, and that's because of trust. And, and then I, I think the other thing, and this is just a, an aside, I had the chance to meet Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I read and studied that quite a bit. Uh, he had come into one of the stations where I was working for a radio interview, and we bumped into each other, and I sat down to talk to him. And, and I think of, of all those habits, and by the way, those are timeless habits. If anybody's out there, I would encourage you to study the seven habits of highly effective people. But 
one of the habits, and, and I believe it's the fifth habit, is to seek first to understand and then to be understood. Mm -hmm. So many times we're trying to make a point. If we will just listen to really understand where somebody's coming from, then we can truly make a difference. And, and you know, that's happened to me in leadership positions. Uh, I have found that I've had team members in conflict, that there were more than just one or two sides to a story. It turned out there were four or five. And I had individuals trying to solve a problem, both coming from good places, but finding themselves in conflict. And a rush to judgment would have killed the, killed the ultimate outcome and the communication. And, and fortunately, you know, I'd made mistakes earlier about not listening well. And, and I tried to improve on that and, and get better at it. So when I was trying to really understand where they were coming from, you know, the light went off that they're both in good places, but they're in conflict. And we can fix that. But, mm -hmm. but being able to, you know, really try to understand first before you're trying to be understood mm -hmm. um, always really resonated deeply with me. Mm -hmm. So I, I throw that out as a piece of advice. Share with us one thing on your bucket list. I got a couple. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate to travel a bit. Uh, on my bucket list is uh, an African safari with the family. Will we get there? Yeah, I certainly hope so sometime. But, you know, I would love to immerse myself in the culture and be able to see animals in their, their real native environment. I'm kind of an animal guy, an animal lover, and uh, I would love to see that. The other things on my bucket list are to finish two books I've always had in the works and I've made starts on them. And then you get distracted and you're doing your thing here. And uh, I need to sit down and actually finish those. Love that. So when the toy companies get around to making an action figure of you, what two accessories is it going to come with? All right. All right. All right. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Mandalorian that's streaming on Disney plus. Mm -hmm. I got to give a tip of the hat to John Favreau because he's written and produced that. And I don't know if you know much about Favreau, but he was actually an elf. And then he's been in a lot of the Marvel movies, incredible talent. And the production values that they put behind that are, are really, truly amazing. So, but for me as an action figure, I, I'm gonna need a, I'm gonna need a lightsaber. I'm gonna need some armor. Uh, maybe it's a Captain America shield. I don't know what it is. And, uh, and ultimately I think I need some sort of a high powered blaster. <laughs> uh, so, so we, we can take care of the bad guys should they show up. So <laughs> I love that. And uh, last question, John, how do people find you? Well, look, yeah, if find us, go to our website. It's Geary company, G E A R Y company.com. Shoot me an email. If we can help you, uh, be happy to talk. It's just real simple. John J O H N at Geary company.com. Shoot me an email. I'd love to talk, love to visit. Uh, anything we can do to help, we'll do it. We're, we're kind of those folks that, you know, we can problem solve a number of things. We've named restaurants. We've actually picked out the carpet for resort properties. We've done, uh, we've named five restaurants within properties. We've actually designed the handles in the bar. Uh, you name it, we, we can do it. But we can also help you find that unique distinction, that differentiator and help you articulate it so that you can reach your goals in the next one, three, and five years. Love it. Thanks so much for being here, John. No, oh, you're awesome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. Once again, I'm Marlena Semenza, photographer and visual strategist. Please comment, like, or share this episode. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. For more information on how I can help you create your iconic image, visit marlenasemenza.com.